My name's Kyle McClellan. I'm a colleague of Dan Fraley. I'm one of the agronomists down based out of the Springfield office. Um, I've been with Brand about a year, so I'm a new face for a lot of you guys that probably come here every year. Um, I grew up southwest of Springfield, kind of where the prairie starts to starts to die and the lighter soils pick up and we get a little closer to Route 16. So today we're going to talk about high yield corn. So where I grew up, a lot of our neighbors would say, I'm happy with 160 bushel corn. But that's not the focus of today's objective. Around Springfield, we've got some of the best ground in the world. We're here in McLean County on some of the best ground in the world, and that's what this stop is going to focus on specifically today. I'll let these two guys introduce themselves. I'm Brad Schmigall. I'm based out of the Fairbury plant. I've uh, been the manager up there for five, six years now. Actually, uh, this group looks like I'm the, the senior of the, the brand, as far as brand goes. Um, but like Kyle said, we're just going to kind of interject as we go through the day, um, or through this station, talking about different things. If you guys have questions on the fly, stop us, throw it out. Uh, you know, something comes up, something you've seen, wanting to know uh, how something you're doing ties in, just stop us right then and, and ask the question, so. Um, Brian Cole, I managed the Cropsey location. Um, I started with Brant a year, not quite a year ago in September. Um, Grew up in the Roberts area, east of here, about 20 miles. Uh, still, still hang around there. Grew up on a family farm. Still involved in that uh, on a limited basis. But uh, as Brad said, if you have questions during this time period, there's no dumb questions. Just go ahead and ask. So Brad, Brian, and I are going to kind of all go through this together. But I'm going to start off the presentation, and I'm going to talk about our high yield corn recommendations. So you guys were given a handout, and that handout is a one page sheet, tried to boil everything that we can talk about with raising high yield corn down into one page, which was pretty difficult, but that's what we did. And uh, this is our recommendations. And these recommendations will change over time. Um, and uh, there's definitely some things that you could have some spirited discussion with us on these high yield recommendations. And I think that's exactly our objective here this morning. So you guys have got a lot of what we're going to go over in your hands, um, but we also have two of these big boards that have the same thing blown up. The, so just however you guys want to follow along. So we got about 40 minutes. I think we'll fill the 40 minutes and then we'll send you guys send you guys on to the next stop. So when we developed these high yield recommendations, we really focused on the information that came from Pleasant Plains. Uh, as Dan mentioned in the opening, that research farm is actually probably eight times larger than this one. It's about 300 acres. And a lot of these trials we do down there, and we've incorporated a lot of the data we've got from this Lexington farm into this sheet. Um, but there are some things that are different because the cultural practices do differ between Bloomington and Springfield. It's, everybody still consider that central Illinois, um, but definitely the practices are a little bit different. So planting date, I think that's something agronomists have uh, changed their tune on the past few years. It used to be wait for 50 degrees, 50 degrees, 50 degrees, and we've really seen somewhere around 50, 48, 49, 51 is the time to go. As long as the soils are dry and there's a, there's a forecast that predicts a warming trend. Some of the best corn I've been around the past five years was planted when the soils were 47 or 48 degrees. So it all depends on that first drink that corn seed takes in. Is it going to be a warm drink? Is it going to be a really cold, shocking drink? Those are really the things we focused on, and I think that's probably more real than just looking at a soil thermometer. So that's pretty, uh, pretty basic. Um, and as we roll down through this sheet, you're going to see bullet points like that, planting date, tillage, nitrogen, sulfur, population, and hydrogen. And then once we get through those, we'll talk about some specific passes through the field and specific recommendations in those passes. And then we're going to, Brian and Brad are going to back that up with data. So if you guys have ever looked at the Brant plot books, you'll see that this, this chart is in every one of them. And this is kind of the meat and potatoes of what Brant does. Everything we do and the recommendation, recommendations we make, like on this sheet, all revolve around these pole positions, what we call them. We rank everything in order by yield increase from our omission plots. So those guys will go over that um, in a little bit. So again, when we go through this and we talk about this, we talk about planting date. 
At Pleasant Plains, we actually are 100% strip tillage. I wouldn't say 100%, 90% strip tillage. Dan is conventional tillage here, so we, we recommend both of those. We strongly recommend incorporation of broadcast P and K. That's something that has changed in the last two years, and uh, you know there may be some no-tillers in this group, but what we've learned out of Ohio, especially with phosphorus, is slight tillage is way better than no tillage. And there's actually been some rules and regulations that the Ohio legislature has put into place. <coughs> and what they found is those rules that they put into place required farmers to work in or deep band for fertility, specifically phosphorus. And they found out that that has helped considerably. Go ahead. So you're talking about incorporation immediately after application, or are you talking about if you did a fall incorporating in the spring is fine, or what are you talking about? Immediate. Immediate. Yep, so if you if you put on your fertilizer, um, whether it's a, it's a suspension or dry, come in and immediately work it in, I'd say as soon as you can. I don't think wait until the spring is, is the data that they have, or the research they've done, it's realistically a couple weeks. So how do you do manage that on your strip till do you band it? So a lot of guys in Ohio have gone to banding, um, but even on strip till, broadcasting it over the top and then lightly working it in with a vertical tillage tool or a disc. I think you know some agronomists are going to shy away from vertical tillage tools, and I'm I'm definitely not against them, but I've seen them cause problems. But they've seen a little bit of incorporation, just throwing a little bit of dirt has definitely improved. The problem. In fact, the, the recent data has shown 90% of the phosphorus that was available to be lost, mostly due to runoff, um, has, has been stopped with incorporation with even a vertical tillage tool. So in Ohio, companies like Brandt, you cannot go out with your spreader trucks anymore and spread P and K on top of the ground. It's illegal. Your customers have to work it in or actually, if you're a customer that's not going to work it in, the retailers have to strip till it or deep band it or something of that nature. So they're kind of leading the way, unfortunately, in, in regulation. But we are learning some things with what they've done. So seeing that data, we do recommend the incorporation of your fertilizer. And I don't think we would have recommended that five years ago. Another, another hot topic before I turn it over to Brian and Brad is nitrogen. Dan and I and Ed, the three agronomists and Brant, we had some spirited discussion around this, but we finally settled on a number. Around Springfield, we are part of the Lake Springfield watershed. And one thing we have found is in 2012, uh, there was enough nitrates in that water shed where they were considering having to halt the water. Um, supply to Springfield because so much nitrogen had gotten into the lake and actually in the spring of 2016 the same thing almost happened. So we have reduced our nitrogen rates around Springfield considerably and there were a lot of producers around Springfield that weren't utilizing a nitrification inhibitor even the way that they should have. So we've went from and John Allen our retail managers in the back he can correct me if I say something out of place but a lot of producers were putting on 220, 240 pounds of fall anhydrous. And really what we've done is we've pulled that back into the 150 to 180 to 190 range. And went to two passes at a minimum. Three passes being even better. Four if you include your fall fertilizer with DAP or MAP. And we've seen no loss in yield. At the Pleasant Plains Farm, we're only putting on about 190 total pounds of nitrogen and raising in some plots 270 280 bushel corn it's been an eye-opening experience for us it was kind of forced um, would we still be putting on a lot of nitrogen if we weren't forced maybe but what we've seen is pulling that back has been good for us now talking to dan and brian and brad you know you guys are a little different up here nitrogen rates may be a little higher still um, and it's certainly warranted but uh, I think that's a challenge that we're going to throw out is we have found splitting that nitrogen application up as many times as you can has been a high yield recommendation with our experience on our research farm at Pleasant Plains. So then are you doing it like four times? Are you at the plot? At, 
at Pleasant Plains, we are putting on about 15 pounds of nitrogen with our DAP. We're putting on about 150 pounds of inhibited fall ammonia, and we're waiting until November, obviously. Um, we're coming back with 28% in a band on the side of the row in a two by zero with our planter. So we're doing three three applications. And we are putting a little bit on with pop-up, but just you, yeah. just, just a few, just a few uh, pounds of nitrogen that way. So actually four times, but the bulk of it is coming in three applications. When you put the 28 on, are you putting anything in it to hold it also? Yep, and I'm gonna let these guys discuss that when we talk about sulfur, but uh, we're, we're utilizing ammonium thiol sulfate as our sulfur source of choice. So Brad or Brian, I'll get these sulfur. Uh, yeah. Uh, so what is your advantage of the fall ammonia, 150 pounds, as opposed to a split in the spring and the side dress? You don't say anything about side dressing on this nitrogen. You found no <coughs> no advantage to side dressing, or, or what are you talking? So that's a big issue we have discussed among ourselves around Springfield. Our data has shown if you're going to side dress, you got to side dress early. And we're talking around the V2 to V3 time frame. Now, Dan and I differ on that. Dan thinks a V3 to V5 has worked better in this part of the world. And I think that's a perfect reason why this farm should be the bell cow for you guys that are buying from these locations up here is you guys need to follow what this farm says, not what our farm says. But what our farm does say is putting on um, nitrogen in a band at planting has been as beneficial as coming in at V4, V5 with a side dress. And intuitively, you don't think that that is how it should work, but that's how the data has sorted out the past few years for brand. Uh, we've got a we've got wide drops. We we side dress, but really it's all been kind of a wash. We've seen that at planting time frame, especially with sulfur, has given us a yield bump that uh, as much or more than a, than a side dress. Now on our family farm, we side dress. We've got real heavy soils. We feel like coming in at V2 or V3, you know, to bust it, especially this year, because we got like six inches of rain the end of April, busting that, busting that up, you know, airifying the soil really helps us. But um, our data supports the two by zero. If you have the planter attachments to do it, works, works well. Well, that's the key, the planter attachments yep. and, and an extra person to haul. I mean, that's a lot of logistics. That's right. Some of our customers would argue that making another pass across the field is another level of management too, though. So we hear both sides. We we're not going to talk guys out of side dressing, but the data has definitely shown that you don't get a 20 bushel bump year after year in Springfield at our farm by side dressing. Like I said, intuitively, it you wouldn't have thought that, but that's the way we've seen that. That's the way we've seen things go. So we need to keep rolling. To, to your point, Keevan. Probably got enough business. Yeah, to your point, Keevan. A lot of what we talk about through this chart, what Kyle's touched on before, you know, it varies per farm, per, you know, everything that you do. You know, we need to sit down and have a conversation. There's not even one number we could point to on this chart and say that, um, you know, this is the nitrogen number we need to be at. This is where we need to be because everything varies on all your different farms, on everybody's farm this year. You know, those kind of things change. That's why we need to sit and have the discussion. And it may not even be just with one of us. You know, we can sit down. Me, Brian, Dan, Kyle, anybody, all collectively together as a group and go over this. Uh, some of the stuff that was on the, the chart here behind it, you know, we talked about uh, Kyle touched on planting date being number one on the chart. Number two was hybrid selection. And everybody knows that, you know, your what hybrid you choose is a very important play in there. But not only what hybrid you choose, but where you put it. You know, that, that ties together. So that rolls into a, our total acre program. And, just another level of management to sit down and and go over and you know keeping up on your soil test that's not even on the on the list there but keeping up on your soil test talking about those hybrids managing the P and K um, everything as you go down the chart and and all those different things play out field by field so it's uh you know after things get wound up in the fall and and stuff like that we can virtually sit and talk all winter to make plans for next year these 
to to absolutely maximize uh, you know the potential we have in the field it's not just make a phone call five minutes before you head to the field and plant and say hey get something out there and let's let's go you know we need to we need to have a, a pretty solid plan together and and that's what will help us get to that next plateau you know pushing our yields as, as absolutely high as we can um, the guys behind me here put up some different charts about sulfur um, one thing we can kind of see this chart here where deficiency showed up in 89 compared to to where it is now um, a lot of that came out of the clean air acts you know they cleaned up our diesels we're scrubbing all these different things we're we're making the air better but what that did is it actually created a sulfur deficiency uh, for our corn crop so that's something we really need to look at uh, staying in Kyle brought up the, the ATS earlier the ammonium thiol sulfate that's that's the product that we've like to chose you know you have sulfur available immediately and then some that will break down over time uh, it works as a nitrogen stabilizer he, he touched on that as far as uh, I think somebody asked if we inhibited the R28 when we put it out there well this kind of naturally works that way so you know we're not only are we getting the sulfur out there for the corn plant but we're we're stabilizing our nitrogen as we go um, just showing some different strip trials here uh, whether we're putting zinc in with it when we go out there um, you know different rates uh, it's, it's a product that can be used both at, at pre-plant with your herbicide and in the in a side dress application um, or both you know, it's, it's a product that's, that's been very versatile it's real nice uh, liquid that, that flows in with everything and and uh, works good for those kind of applications uh, hopefully you guys have been you know been exposed to that but if, if you haven't um, you know, if you start to see some striping in here, yellow that runs down the veins, uh, every other, it alternates. One, you'll have one yellow, one green. Uh, you see it in young corn like we have pictured there. It's something that's really took off and, and we've just really seen a substantial, we covered up the actual number here, but just a substantial bump in yield. I don't know if you guys remember that number off the top of your head, but um, if I can just cheat and look here. I'm just going to take this down. But you know that's one that we've we've seen a a lot of getting the, the ATS out there, um, and and the zinc is also another one that may be different spots here on the chart. But you know we can roll. It's actually the same pass, kind of the same with the the Stroby and the, the Smart B at Tassel. You know those are products that that we look at a we're going to run them together, and we're going to get different benefits out of that. But one thing the boron's really done for you guys that are applying. Uh, you know your fungicide this this time of year kind of just getting through that season putting boron on at that tassel time really opens up that stalk and really helps those nutrients move in there so you know it's it's, it's just seen substantial gains and things like that because like everybody touched on roi is, is a big deal we're not just looking to make application for the sake of doing it we want return on that investment so um well, brian if you got something you want to roll into sure I guess uh, I'm back clean up here so I get to compile here some things and, and part of what I'm going to talk about is challenging you guys to try something different on your farm and you know I haven't been at Brant very long but one of the things that was intriguing for me to come to Brant was this farm right here and what they're doing and we're not comparing uh, hybrids or insecticides or herbicides or anything like that this is total agronomics and trying to bring more value to you guys. And the thing that I love is what they're doing here with this, finding out what's the best bang for the buck, and even better, we've got multiple years worth of data. None of this one hit wonder stuff that, <clears throat> that works this year and not the next. You know, so we've got six years on this particular deal, and in the book, you're gonna see some of the like, 10 years out. So. We can bat a better average off this data. If I give Keevan 10, 10 shots at, at a free throw and I get 100, I'm going to win every time. Keevan was a pretty good basketball player from what I understand, but I'm going to beat him in this deal because we've got more chances and to look at this data. Um, so, and I'm not going to go through every one of them. I'm going to hit one we haven't even talked about, the Smart Trio. If you come over here, make sure you get on the right line. Look at the return on investment there on a 
relatively inexpensive product. And, and also in the short time I've been with Brandt and, and starting to learn these products, um, a lot of our competitors use this product. Maybe not right around here, but there's a lot of that product sold for the simple reason is it works. Um, so and a lot of you probably use that already. And just getting back to the nitrogen, I'm gonna tie the nitrogen rate, um, banding, timing, I'm just gonna kind of put that all together and elaborate a little bit on what Kyle started talking about, about um, splitting up your tr trips of nitrogen. If you're not doing it, you probably should be. Um, and don't make it hard. Don't feel like you have to do ammonia, you have to do 28, you have to side dress. Um, the guys have been dealing with me for the last several years. There's not one of them the same. We're doing fall ammonia, spring apply 28, spring apply 28, side dress 28, spring apply 28, side dress ammonia. I think you need to pick what works for your farm and that's going to be different east here than it is here. And it's also going to be different uh, depending on your labor and what you can get done. Maybe you don't like ammonia because of the safety concerns. Maybe you like 28 because you can get through it faster and you've already got a trailer or a truck to haul herbicide, so it's easy to haul 28. But I think split application of nitrogen, um, a lot of times are going to be better than just straight fall ammonia or straight high gallons of 28. Um, Fungicide response, <clears throat> for the guys that have done it and seen the results, um, you know what can happen there. Um, I do it every year on my farm. I don't even scout it. I just do it. Because the first year I did it, I seen a 48 bushel increase. That was good enough for me to say, hey, I'm going to bat for the average on that. Um, zinc, sulfur and zinc are big in my book if you're growing corn try to find a way to get that in there you know you, you can throw the whole kitchen sink at it but what I would challenge you to do is try to pick three things here that you're not doing and and just try it maybe, maybe don't go whole hog but just try to incorporate something in there because um, a lot of times if you just do one thing your chances aren't very good um, if you just do smart trio um, but couple some things together. Do some trio, do some fungicide, maybe do something different with your nitrogen. Um, I know Fraley here at the, at the plot is doing a lot of this banding. And I know not very many people in East Central Illinois are set up to band. We've got away from starters and stuff, but he's, I think he's really on to something with this banding. It's spoon and feeding <clears throat> the right stuff at the right time in the right place. That's where this whole things going is spoon feeding nutrients um, and guys it's not that we can't find some of these products in in uh, in our soils you know some of the better soils that we have the zinc that we talk about you know some of the sulfur we talk about the changes but it's the fact of if, if we're gonna push our corn yield clear up to the level of being elite like we want to be you know this it's just something that we have to add into the mix I guess I don't know how we're doing on time, but um, we'd love to have some questions or questions. agree to disagree or... What's the line that says tillage system? What does that mean? Uh, you got an 18 bushel advantage, but it doesn't say what the tillage system is comparing. Number seven. The, the book goes in... Oh, sorry, Kyle. I was going to say, Kyle. so with planes, we're comparing strip till to what well, we, we rent a ripper so we'll come in we'll rip certain trials and we do no-till and we also do actually we've given up on no-till we're doing no-till and cereal rye so what that's comparing is a uh, actually strip till and conventional till for us are, are about the same um, but that's comparing the cereal rye cover crop no-till to the average of what <laughs> the highest makes so uh, I think depending on the year strip till and one, two, they kind of trade places. We really focus on trying to make cereal rye work. I mean, we side dress it, we put starter on, terminate it early, and we just, we haven't had a lot of success with cereal rye ahead of corn. And that's a big part of where that big gap is coming from on the tillage system. As you, right behind us, Dan has got these, these two, this big field split in two. The back is traditional management, and the front is high management. 
Well, planes, we have similar setup, only have four. And one of those ranges is nothing but changes in tillage. So if you plant through, you'll plant the same hybrid through four different tillage systems. And that's how we, we develop that number. And one thing about this is, is we're always comparing the highest to the lowest. So you see planting date being 80 bushel average. That's the April corn versus the June 1st corn. And we have planting dates in between, but we're, we're always comparing the gap. And if you have the plot book, it'll show every number in between. But when we do these positions, that's how we come up with those numbers. And that's what makes them big in some cases. Let's go a little more in depth about the corn that we are standing next to. Right here about our tent, you can see it. We can go through it real quick, but on this sheet you guys have got in your hand, we broke it down by passes in corn. Application one, application two, application three. These are recommendations we've made for high yield. Brian mentioned it earlier. If you're wanting to push an 80, you're wanting to push a 40, you're wanting to take 20 acres out of a 40, whatever, these are things that we would recommend. And these are soil tests and maintenance that we would recommend to achieve that if you don't have these soil tests which a lot of guys don't um, just for whatever reason you know cash rent and those things um, by all means that might not be the best field to, to play around on high yield recommendations with but we talk about pre-emerge we talk about 28 sulfur we talk about smart trio at one quart there's a brand new product that a lot, a lot of guys know about that brands testing heavily this year all across the country. It's called InBoost 5. If you want to learn more about that, we'd be happy to talk to you about it afterwards. And then at a VT to R2 timing, uh, generally with an airplane, but this year a lot of guys were running over the top with Heggies. Um, a dual mode of action, Strobe and insecticide. We sprayed a lot of insecticide down around Springfield this year because of Jap beetles. And it definitely was the right decision in hindsight because the fields that didn't get sprayed, how hard they got clipped afterwards and how messy the end of the ears are. Smart B Mo, which is a replacement for the old B Molly. Uh, it's, a new, it's a new boron. AJ from BSF is going to talk to you about that product. Actually, it's one of the lead products they've seen at their research farm. So I won't, I won't spoil his fun and then in Boost 5 again. And I'm a big stickler on harvest and high yield corn above 20%. You guys that, uh, that love your elevators and just love to, love to take the wet corn so they can hammer you on shrink and, and, um, and drying costs. Um, I'm sure you like to harvest around then too, being kind of funny. But really, we've seen for years the data come back that uh, for about every 1% moisture loss, you lose about that much in yield. So if you go from 25% corn to 15, you'll lose about 10%. And I think anybody that's done those tests has probably seen that. It comes down to economics, but on high yield corn, um, 250 bushel yield level, you're talking about 25 bushel. So there's nothing really we can recommend as an agronomy team that's going to gain you a solid 25 bushel the way harvesting corn early will. Um, we're very beneficial south of, around Springfield because we've got good soils on southern heat. You know, the prairie ends down there. But we've still got good soils with, uh, I'd say we were probably consistently four to five degrees warmer than you guys all last week. You know, we just accumulate more heat. So we don't have to dry corn as much, but we still see this uh, with our customers as well. So Brian and, or Brad, you want to go over that, and then we'll be ready to turn you guys loose if we've got time. I don't think they're, they're not moving yet. So okay. what we have on this chart here is just uh, <coughs> talking about kind of back to the the total acre concept that I touched on earlier. Um, you know, we talk about typical programs. And here's the populations across the bottom, and those are the blue bars. In the total acre program, where we use the same populations, but went in with that high management, with the extra focus on the fertility and, and uh, keeping the nutrients to them and things like that, we saw what, at those same population levels, but uh, pushing the, the, high, the high management side of, of those populations will do. 
So, you know, it was kind of an eye-opening chart that you can get that kind of production out of that. It's just one of those, you got to handle it different. You know, you, sometimes you got to realize you, you make one, one change in your operation, but you got to look into the, the other factors that, that go into that. You know, maybe you, you bump populations up to the level that we're looking at. Well, keep in mind, you might have to adjust your nitrogen or your, uh, you know, dry fertility accordingly to get the ultimate top end you want out of that. So that's, in a nutshell, kind of what we're looking at on the chart here. Uh, th these bars are just 20 inch rows compared to 30s. But, uh, you know, just another plug for sitting down with the Total Acre program and just, just analyzing everything to the, to the best of our ability and utilizing all the technology we have available to us. You know, it's an ever-changing world out there and we need to do something or as much as we can with the data that we're collecting. So. This chart was developed from this plot right here. This is not Pleasant Plains data. This is all Lexington data out of this trial. So what do you got for dollars difference between the 288 bushel to the $2.50 or the 256? What's the dollar difference? If I didn't do anything as, to as go far as as far as return on investment? Yeah. 